Welcome, 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 beautiful people out there in Facebook land, in YouTube land, in wherever land you're living in at this uh, crazy time. My name is Brett Parry. I'm the cultural mentor. And this is Two Chaps, Many Cultures, another bonus episode. Three days into this project and we're already giving away bonus episodes. I don't believe it. Absolutely fantastic. My friend Christian Hufler there in the screen. Of course, you can see the wonderful Vicky Flyer Hudson there joining us. And uh, so welcome, Vicky. Welcome, Christian. How are you today? Thank you so much, Brett. It's so good to be here. I'm doing, uh, I think I'm doing okay. <laughs> I, just, I had to think about it for a second. <laughs> <laughs> well, fantastic. Yeah. And uh, thanks well, for being on, Vicky. This is awesome. My this pleasure. Thank you for yeah. having me. Of course, uh, Kristen and, and Vicky are both in Atlanta. I'm up here in, uh, in, Chicago, Chicago, <laughs> um, and uh, enjoying enjoying very very warm toasty weather. And uh, but here we're here to talk about. We wanted to get Vicky on. Vicky and I had a little discussion. Um, I found a common bond in our experience as uh, as singers and performers in in bands, right? And uh, and we discovered this really. Uh, of, I don't know. It was a little bit accidental, wasn't it? Um, uh, I kind of knew you did it, and and uh, and and we were at the CETAR conferences and and that kind of st stuff. We've know we've known each other, but we've never had a chance to talk about it. And um, and Chris, in your little connection with music back in your home country, tell us a little bit about that. Well, connection with music is is I'm not an active musician. I've never been. My parents tried to make sure that I learn an instrument because that's part of a a rounded bourgeois educational experience in, in, in my home country. No, actually, um, it was keys. So um, okay. keyboard. But I, I grew up in the 80s, so that was the time when people oh. thought it was cool to learn how to play the keyboard instead of playing the piano. Um, I, I, I didn't take much to it. However, later in life, my first career out of university was I worked at a publishing company that produces a music industry trade magazine and i worked uh, for a music trade for many many years so here in the united states it would be called the billboard magazine i worked for what is the german equivalent of the billboard magazine ah so rub shoulders with some famous people no doubt <laughs> yeah yeah um <laughs> yeah. that 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 did happen too and well, they no, let me put it with you. That's that's the important thing. <laughs> no, I, I doubt it. I, I remember that. And th th this is a story that that I may have told one too many times, but I, I do remember meeting Jay Z um, in his hotel room in in Munich when we were, um, well long story but uh, this was before <laughs> beyonce this was before he was as big as his he's now but it, that was in 1999 so i think the black album had dropped already so he was working with dre and all so i was this fairly young editor he was the rising star of hip-hop and man the handshake he gave me i will never forget it was a dead <laughs> fish it was this <laughs> I, was, I was like my my gut reflex, and this was before I worked in this cultural field, right? My gut reflex was, what is this, dude? Am I not black enough for you? Is this why you're not giving me a proper handshake? Am I not cool enough for you? Or am I just one of the minions here that you, or maybe he was just jet lag. But my, my <laughs> first reaction was like, ah, I don't like this. Now, several years later, I recognize there may have been many other factors at play why he was not at full handshaking capacity at that time. Mm, and I, uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm quite fond of the gentleman and his work, um, but that was uh, a strange first impression. Absolutely. Well, first impressions are important when we're talking about intercultural work and Vicky. So let's talk about your work. Um, first of all, let's let's start with work. Let's get the work out of the way. We want to yeah, get yeah. Well, we've got to get past that. <laughs> work out of the way let's talk about you uh you describe yourself as a diversity facilitator yes um a uh, a trainer a coach uh and what what does that work involve what, what does that what does that bring you in terms of uh, the types of things and people you engage with yeah so i i like to think of myself as a person who helps companies release the power of their diverse teams 
Uh, there's so much power in diversity. There's so much to leverage there. Uh, we get the best from everyone when we have uh, that welcoming environment. And uh, so my work really centers around that. It started back in uh, 16 years ago. So my company's been around for 16 years, just celebrated 16 years in May. And it started with, thank you very much. <laughs> Can hardly believe it myself. Uh, started out with um, a lot of my work centering around U.S.-India partnerships because there were so many cultural challenges and, and really still are. I, I still do a lot of that work and some of those same cultural challenges come up over and over uh, and has kind of evolved from there. So I, I love working with senior leaders. Uh, I think most of the change comes from the very top. So if you want to have a an inclusive culture. If you want to have change in your culture, it's got to start at the top. So big fan of working with senior leaders. And uh, I, I use music a lot in my work. It's There's a lot of crossover for me. And so I'm excited about this discussion. Fantastic. And you've lived in a bunch of places. I mean, uh, you've, you've been around the, the world. I've been around. <laughs> you've been around the world a few times. You've got, yeah. uh, you've got plenty of experience behind you. So we're, we're where have you traveled to? Where have you lived? What, what, uh, and how does that form part of your work as well? Oh, it, it really is everything. Uh, and so in when I got my first job, and some of my uh, colleagues from that job may be watching right now, so they'll remember this, but uh, I graduated college, moved to, uh, I grew up in LA, graduated from UC Santa Barbara, moved to Atlanta, and got a job within two weeks of my arrival here. And about a few months into that job, I was like looking around at my cubicle and I said to myself, is this really it? Like, is this all there is to life? I've gone to school my entire life and now I'm sitting in a cube and that just can't be it. I mean, it can't be all there is. And uh, I'd always been fascinated by Asia. That was kind of where my heart was drawing me. And so I, I asked my boss for a leave of absence and I said, I really just want to go to Asia for a couple months, be more of a global citizen. I'm going to bring that knowledge back. I'm going to come back. I really like this job, but I, I just feel like I need to do this. And she said, well, we don't really do that. Uh, we don't give leaves of absence for other than medical reasons. And I said, okay, then I quit. So I left my corporate job <laughs> and I, I went to Thailand for two months and I traveled by myself from north to south to east to west. And, and I just had the time of my life. And I came back and the company rehired me because they were growing really fast and they rehired me. I was a technical writer and I did some training and, and they rehired me. And about eight months later, I had the same feeling. I'm looking around in my cube and I said, I, I can't do this. And I asked for leave of absence. They said no. And I said, I quit. And I went back to Thailand and I went to India. And this time I was gone for a year. And I also lived in Nepal for six months. And I, uh, I taught school and I, I took any odd job that would give me room and board so that I could learn about the cultures. So I worked in a library, a hospital. I taught English to doctors and nurses at the government psychiatric hospital in Bangkok. Uh, I've just done you know, any job I could do for room and board. And this pattern of quitting and coming back and then traveling the world went on for eight years. <laughs> I would quit and then I would come back and every time I would get rehired into better positions because the company was growing so fast. So I really cut my teeth in the business world, um, learned to, to, I ended up being uh, like a software analyst for the last like four years of the job and really learned just how to speak the language of business, um, had a knack for technology. And at the end of that eight years, I finally said to myself, you know, I could do this forever or I could do something more meaningful. And hence my company was born. So. I've traveled to the Middle East. I've traveled uh, parts of Asia, um, many parts of Europe, uh, Mexico, uh, Iceland, was all over the place. And I think all of those cultures have made me better. Excellent. I love that. All of these cultures have made me better. They have. This, the, the, this is this is the. For me, that sounds like the distilled version of that overused Mark Twain quote that. Travel is the best antidote antidote to to bigotry and and narrow mindedness. And mm. yep, they made yeah. us better. It makes us better if we see a different point of view, isn't it? 
Truly. I mean, I can honestly say that in addition to, I think, being just more aware of different perspectives, I honestly gained so many skills, like particularly from India is where I've spent the most time. And I can say that I'm uh, India has added to my business repertoire of skills, my communication repertoire. So even beyond perspective, just actually gaining different ways of doing things. Uh, it just it's made me better. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm I'm curious. I want to drill into this. What specifically did you add to your communication repertoire by living and and working and traveling in Thailand, India, and Nepal? What would you say was missing in your communication repertoire that you picked up on these trips or on these stints? Yeah, I think it was uh, just having more flexibility in my communication. So I've always been kind of a a diplomat, peacemaker personality. Uh, but I also did enjoy or do enjoy and see the value of direct communication, particularly in conflict. And uh, I worked in Germany as well in a software implementation. And so I think from both of these cultures, India and Germany, I just learned to expand the spectrum of directness and indirectness on both sides. Mm -hmm. And there's so many different situations now that I can address because that got expanded. So I can be more direct in certain scenarios. Uh, and I think lately that's kind of been coming in handy. You know, there's been some things that I've had to say a little bit more directly. And then from India, I learned how to be both actually, because in India, the communication style is very, very complex. There's, there is some indirectness and kind of harmony preserving, but there's also some extreme directness. And so you learn how to nuance your communication based on the situation. And I can also then get along with more people, just connect with more people because I can adapt my style to their style. And I don't feel disingenuous doing that. I feel expanded. Mm. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Um, uh, there, there's a term that I frequently borrow from Andy Molinsky's book, Global Dexterity, and he uses mm, that term of zone of appropriateness or zone of appropriate behavior to one. So yeah. you expanded your zone of appropriateness, basically. Yeah, right? nice. yeah, absolutely. I expanded myself and I feel like I then brought all of that back to my home culture in the U.S. and it helps me uh, live a better life here as well because mm. I took all those things back with me and they've all become a part of who I am. So sometimes when people say, you know, well, oh, I, I have to adapt to another culture. I mean, isn't that going to be losing myself? And to that, I say, no, it's the opposite. You're adding to yourself. Yep. That, that's a very, very important point. Thank you for, for, for that. Vicki and Brett, I, I want to steer both of you into the direction of how do you intuitively or um, because you were trained to do this, because you practiced and rehearsed by being on a stage, how does your experience in musical performance, in singing or in acting out in front of people with a mic in hand or an instrument in front of you, how... Does that or does that affect how you work with your clients? How does does that affect how you show up in the world? I'm curious. Oh my gosh, hundred percent. But Brett, do you want to do you want to add to that first or? Yeah, I'm just going to throw an image up here for Vicky. Oh, thank you, <laughs> a man after my own heart. <laughs> okay, yes. we need to we need to debrief this. Yeah, we'll debrief that. Exactly. We're, we're going to leave that sit for a bit because okay, the yeah. <laughs> The reason that the reason that we had a, uh, the Vic and I had these discussions is that we found when we were relating our experiences in being on a stage, is that how much we bring that to our training and facilitating and coaching. How we, the performance of standing in front of a crowd and understand or getting a feeling for their mood, uh, their their openness to either dance more or quieten, quieten the hell down, you know, give them a, give them a break, don't let them have a pee break and a, and a drink break, is I think key to what I really enjoyed about sitting on stage. Yes, it was great to sing and it was always good fun. It was good fun to be a, in a group and a band that could create this, uh, this art. But the important thing was I found after doing it for such a long time and so much, um, that it was just intuitive. You knew exactly when to change the mood, to take to 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 take the direction of the crowd and the audience, and that that's kind of how I interpret. That's how I interpreted my experience in now applying that to doing coaching and training. 
So that was where I asked Vicky about that. And so we'll get to this. We'll go back to this image here because Vicky is the lead singer of a band that's called? The Spirit of Rush. <laughs> yeah. So it's a Rush tribute band. <laughs> that, and that's Rush on the screen. And for those who aren't familiar, Rush is a Canadian progressive rock trio. They are um, retired now. And we just recently lost one of them, unfortunately, to brain cancer. Uh, but I've been a fan since I was 14 years old. And for the last seven years, I've had this tribute band that plays all Rush music, all Rush, all the time. Yeah, Which all is, right. you know, what a rush. <laughs> what a rush. And, uh, and I, 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 I wasn't a, ever really a big fan of Rush, you know. It's one of those things. I wasn't a big fan of the Rolling Stones either, but, you know, until I saw them live. Now, I've mm. never seen Rush live, but what I did is I watched that documentary, that la, the, fi, the documentary about the final tour and that and it's interesting when you when you watch musicians and the way they interact and the and and, and the way they bring their or they they perform their art it's just amazing i mean neil pert who we're talking about who uh, passed away you know he's he was just a machine i mean the guy did not know when to switch off and nobody really knew uh, there were experiences where he went riding on his bike and he he had blisters and and calluses on his feet that were that were that were hurting him so much but he still got up there on the drum kit man and beat and and, and i mean it was just a they're a wonderful band i mean technically te how good dedicated are they? and just and yeah where do you find musicians that can play that stuff that's what i want to know i <laughs> am so fortunate and i hope that they're watching right now <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. So I was, when I was 40 years old, I decided to take up music again. I'd kind of played off and on through high school and college and then had given it up for a while. And when I turned 40, I decided to celebrate by putting on a house concert. So I had a little concert in my house for 45 of my friends and family crammed into my living room. And this was kind of a wake up call for me around uh, a couple of things. One is authenticity, you know, and I think this is kind of tying back to Christian's question about, you know, um, just how does how does your intuition or how does being on a stage connect with this? For me, it's about bringing my full self into uh, everything I do, you know, my speaking, my coaching. And so uh, I did this 40th birthday concert and I decided that there was real potential here for me to expand once again just like with the cultures music is a culture right and particularly any given music scene in, in any given city and it was a way for me to expand myself but more than that it was a way for me to reach people and connect with people and so i started going to these open mics and i would play rush songs at these open mics and i i met a couple of guys uh, i met this one particular guy that said there's this kid who is an incredible guitar player who loves rush his name is reese i hope he's watching and uh he said you guys have to meet and so he introduced us and we played you know we kind of did like a little jam session and then he said um maybe we can do this again at the next one and play like more Rush songs. And I said, yeah, but who are we going to get to play drums and bass? And he said, well, I got a couple of guys. <laughs> and that was my drummer and bassist. And we got together and we jammed some Rush. And almost from the, the be very beginning, day one, it was almost perfect. And we had such a connection as, as people as well. And one of the things that I love about being a musician is the access I get to people from all backgrounds, all ages, all political views, differences, just so many differences because music unites, but the people who play it, you know, you get people from all over the spectrum. And I, I see that as a highly fortunate situation for me because I don't get into an echo chamber. It allows me to hear uh, different perspectives different ways people approach music, the, the way they approach life. Um, but I think more than anything, it has allowed me to be wholly authentic and to just reach out and really connect with people. I started inviting clients to shows. I started putting our videos into presentations and I've never gotten a bad response to this. This is always viewed positively. And I think that's because people are wanting that authenticity. They want that connection. So I'm hearing something um, because my question may have been incomplete. I've just recognized I asked you 
how your experience of musical performance is shaping how you train coach how you show up in the room it also if i heard you right it also taught you or expanded how you listen it's not just about 100%. the sending it's also about the receiving right 100 ah, percent. i've okay. heard things i've heard views and and perspectives that i i absolutely would not have had access to uh without the musician community and while i don't agree with all of those views some i do some i don't hmm. uh, it has really allowed me not to become myopic in my view of of situations and particularly current events uh, and it, it has allowed me to flex my skills like keep them sharp i guess is a better way to say that because we ourselves as intercultural practitioners we have to continually model these behaviors and i think being part of the music community allows me to do that because we have again people from just all backgrounds all ages you know different views and so you constantly have to be aware that um, the way you see things is not the way that everybody sees things and so it keeps my skills sharp mm -hmm. i feel yeah and it's just great fun for me and i think that's probably the hardest part of the pandemic for me is uh, being without my band we're, we're not playing right now because obviously mm -hmm. bars you know we don't feel comfortable but uh, it's really difficult i must say I I live close to the Atl Atlanta Beltline, and for those of you who are not from Atlanta, the Google it, Atlanta Beltline. We don't need to explain too much about this, but this is a pedestrian and bicyclist uh, track uh, in the inner city. And my wife and I, we were, we were riding our bikes a couple of days ago, and there was this band, I think it was a four-piece. They set up their band outside there in the open with, with a little carry on amp and I think a generator to, to power the amp and they were under this underpass and cranking it out. So the, some, some people are finding ways to perform regardless, right? So Absolutely. it's not always easy, it depends on the type of music you play. But um, Brett, I know many, many of you may not know this, may not be aware of this, but Mr. Perry here from Sydney, Australia is a trained opera singer. <laughs> so I didn't um, know that. <laughs> there we go. So probably the, the let's say the musical, Di uh, what, what's the what's the word? It's it's the opposite spectrum, so to say. You we're, we're thinking Russian rock and roll and rock. opera, yeah. And here, here's <laughs> opera. So well, much of the chagrin of my vocal coach when I decided to go and you know turn all the wonderful teaching that you gave me into a uh, rock and roll into fronting a rock and roll band. <laughs> well, you did that too. I see that I didn't. I, I did that too, but uh, uh, you know I, I think that. Um, you know, I'm not a, a classical moving uh, music buff. I'm not a, not knowledgeable, but I, but I, I find joy in a lot of it because I was exposed to it. You know, by by that practice, that discipline, learning that discipline of vocal, correct vocal, you know, phrasing and, and breathing and all that kind of Absolutely. stuff. Absolutely. But it was. Um, and one of my big inspirations is Ben Zander. He's a uh, director of the Boston Philharmonic, and then he developed a, the Boston Youth Orchestra as well. And he brings a lot of, and he wrote a book with his wife, Roz, uh, that, that was called The Art of Possibility. And he talks about the using classical music as a metaphor and as a training platform for teaching people in business, right? This is... This is what you do too, Vicky. You know, it's, it's it's bringing out the possibility of understanding, analyzing, and interpreting the intention of a, of a composer, even when they lived four hundred years ago, and mm. and and exposing that to a a youth player who may not, who maybe just have gone, you know, beep beep beep, like note for note, note note for note, but not understood the deeper part of the music. And um, and you can go to YouTube and go to the Boston Philharmonic and see any number of videos where Ben Zander takes these children, takes these these youth in front of an audience, and he brings this out. them the, the the transformation into what they played before in this session and what they play afterwards is is even for people who don't know classical music, I think you'd be hard pressed not to notice it. So it, it, this is what this is again what my um, and I don't know whether it's the same for you and uh, you guys, is that when I start with a client, I want to get to that point where I want to inspire them to 
sound, look, think, listen differently than before I started with them. Mm, I love that. And I heard something else too, Brad, in what you were saying that you were talking about, you know, you took what your vocal coach taught you in opera and you applied it to fronting a rock band and that she might have been dismayed. Uh, and I see a comment on Facebook, that, uh, you know, that uh, go tell that to Queen that opera is not diametrically opposed. No. But I think. All right, uh, all right, all right, Sue. I, I stand <laughs> But I think that's an interesting point that, you know, those are kind of like two cultures, right, that that actually are not as as opposite as they do seem on the outside, because I can see Christian's point, you know, that it does seem sort of like two different worlds. Uh, right. But somehow we as musicians, we can often find these connecting points. And I think we do the same in our work that uh, you take two cultures that seem very opposed in in their communication, in their approach to hierarchy, in their approach to deadlines, whatever that thing is, and you find that connecting point where you can be both connective and see the things you have in common and recognize that the differences are what actually makes the power behind it, right? right. Because with Queen, I mean, that is exactly what they did. They took opera and rock and they used both to create this incredibly powerful music. And it's, it's, it was the difference between the two that made the power that gave the dynamic and, and uh, I think made them so appealing. So I think there's really something in there about connection and difference operating together to create a more powerful dynamic. And we leverage that for good, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. And I, I, I do think that, both of your musical experience and training um, play a critical role in any type of, well, let me call it teaching. And I'm, while I'm not a trained musician, I, I do think I recognize the, the pattern here. And I've, I've tr trained myself to develop some, some flexibility around that myself without being a trained musician. But I think the way we in our field, whether you're training and coaching in the cultural or in the diversity, inclusion, equity arena, or whether you're a corporate trainer, if you're teaching somebody something, you put yourself out there. You, you put mm. yourself in front of an audience, whether it be an audience of one or an audience of many, it doesn't matter because you set the energy. You you model for the student or students, plural, how you would like them to follow you, how you would like them to have a certain experience, how you want them to soak up the information that you prepared for them. I and and I, I had to train myself because I, I come from a culture where we are taught to communicate in a fairly restrained manner, where facts matter and the emotionality is only a distraction or may even be... Um, frowned upon because I might not appear professional enough by being too lively or too animated. Mm. And I, I had several musical experiences as, a, uh, as an audience member where I recognized that in me and in the group, the audience that I was part of, I remember vividly being, that was in my college years, we were in a small club in some rural Bavarian town that I actually don't remember the name of. And we were in this club that fit maybe, maybe two, 300 people tops. I mean, maybe less than 300. And I didn't know what to expect. Some friend of said, a friend of mine said, Christian, we're going to that club tonight. I said, what's happening? But I don't, I don't care. I'm a college age kid and I'll go anywhere. Um, so it turned out it was the JBs, the JB Horns, Fred Wesley, P. Ellis, Macy Parker. And if you don't know who that is, that was the horn section of the James Brown stage experience. Ah, okay. So the, these gentlemen in their trombones and their saxophone, their trumpets, and they had the drummer and the bass player too. So the whole bass, I'd say the backup band of James Brown was in that club in Southern Germany in a small rural town. And I was there in the middle, surrounded by Germans, really stiff around the hip and not really knowing how to move, including myself. And I noticed how the music changed, how the energy changed the energy in the room, how people became more receptive because they allowed the music to move them, right? So wow. free your ass and the rest will follow. And that, that's what happened. So that is a quality. If you have that as a teacher, if you have that as an instructor, facilitator, trainer, whatever the label is, that is something that can really help the student or the clients to 
have more than a lecture. I could right. not agree more with this, Christian. I mean, this is like such a, a point near and dear to my heart because there have been times when I've questioned whether I should show up in a particular culture. You know, if I'm doing, uh, I did a leadership session where they flew people in from all over the world. And these were the top level leaders of this company. There were like 110 of them. And I'm thinking to myself, is this the time for me to bring in my video of me singing, you know, uh, Tom Sawyer, Spirit of Rush? and talking about Rush and you know, using music analogies and showing pictures of myself in stage gear, which obviously is very different from how I look now. And um, it was funny because I was speaking with the client about it and, I was t and he asked me, the president of the company, and this is a huge company, this one guy was a, had a team of like 10,000 people. And he said, I really wanna go over your slides with you first before we, you know, kind of sign off on them. And that, that's not typical, but I, I said, okay, considering the stakes are really high for this program. And so we were going through and I showed him the video of me with Spirit of Rush. And I said, yeah, I'm not entirely sure if I'm going to put that in there. And he said, you must. Mm. And I said, oh, and he said, because it's not just one of your strengths. It's one of your biggest strengths. And I mean, this really like struck me and this was a very sort of conservative man who spoke, uh, you know, in a very sort of toned down way most of the time. But, and I did, I put the video in there and it just changed the whole energy in the room. Like immediately these hundred and something leaders could connect with me and it made the whole rest of the session flow so much more easily because I was putting myself on the table and saying, I'm showing up here authentically. And uh, you know, I know that we are supposed to be mindful and adapt to different styles, in particular when we're in another country and we're kind of needing to play by their rules. But I have found that the music piece has translated fairly universally, at least in my own experience, and that it could be different for the two of you, but the music experience has translated almost every time. I can't think of a time where it was re responded to or reacted to negatively. And uh, it's, yeah, people recognize when you're bringing your authentic self as uh, someone just commented here. And, and for me, it also makes it more fun. And so the audience and the speaker are like mirrors of each other. If it's inspiring to me, hopefully it's gonna be inspiring to them. Mm. Yeah. Beautiful. That's, that's why I use the, um, I use my Ben Zander videos. Uh, it, I, I use a couple of them. Um, I will use an example where I uh, there's a him working with a very young Chinese violinist, and uh, and he, I mean, I guess my only issue with Ben Zander is I mean he's so high level thinking. Um, sometimes he misses the culture, right, of the cultural cues, mm -hmm. and, and and it was with a. A, a young, very young Chinese student, she, she wouldn't have been any more than eight or nine years old, this young girl. She played beautiful violin. It was wonderful. And, uh, but he was, he was trying to bring out some more expression in her. And, and it was just interesting that at the end of that video, he, he really recognised he, he, he wasn't trying to work. He, the important thing wasn't to try and work with a student. It wasn't to work with the teachers either. The teachers were obviously very good teachers, very technically wonderful. He turned to the mother and said, what, it, what is it about, you know, tell me about your daughter. Um, he says this in the video and, and he says, do you think she's beautiful? And, and this lady says, uh, no, not particularly. And this is a video, like you've got to pick your moment when you play a video like this because it can go into stereotypes and yeah, yeah. all that kind of stuff, which, which that's not what we're about to do. But I use it as an expression where somebody can miss the cues, miss the, cue, the possible cultural, cultural cues and, and just, you know, even and just stick to a point and bang it to death without, without really recognising their audience and respecting the audience, that's true. right? That, that's and true. And so I, I think it, there's so it, there's so much kind of real. You now Ben Zander says, you know, I, I know when I'm reaching somebody is when their when their eyes are shining, right? Mm. Uh, and and he takes responsibility for it. He said, if their if their eyes are not shining, I'm not doing. What is it I'm not doing that I'm failing them in? He doesn't put it on them. He doesn't put it on them and say, 
you know, it's their fault that they just can't get it. They can't love classical music. It's not their fault. It's it's on us as the performers. If we don't bring ourselves, if we don't perform in the right way that brings the joy out in them, then that's our fault. That's not their fault. That's not the audience's fault. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and I actually think that to your point, Brad, this is a great story, by the way. I hadn't heard that one. But I think to your point, there's actually a layered learning available in there. Because if you bring, say, music into a presentation and into a particular culture and it doesn't resonate, that it, in itself is a point of learning that you can bring up right there in that moment. And I've done that where I've said, I'm about to show you this you know, picture of me with the guitar or whatever. Uh, but for some of you, that actually might, it might bring up some uncomfortable feelings about professionalism. And we can talk about what professionalism means across cultures. Mm. Yeah. So there, there's almost like learning opportunities that are kind of built into bringing that authenticity. And I think to your point, Brett, as long as you are tuned in to the cues and if you see that discomfort or if you see uh, if you see that people aren't responding, then maybe it's a point of learning and you can kind of turn it around that way. But I think, you know, it's it's kind of a balance between we have to bring the joy to others as performers. But I think we first have to bring it to ourselves and I, I do a lot of public speaking coaching because that's just something I've been asked to do over the years. And I often tell that to my uh, clients that as a speaker, if you want to inspire others, you have to be inspired yourself. You have to mm. bring something to the table for you that makes you feel excited and makes your eyes shine. And then that kind of mirrors outward. And even if people don't always get it, I mean, this is one thing I love about Rush is, you know, they always stuck to their stuck to their authenticity. And even when the record company was like, you have to make these more commercial <laughs> songs. And they were like, no, we're going to make the music that we want to make. And they took a gamble on that and it, and it worked out. And, and they sold more records than any band other than the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. But they decided to take that risk. And for me, that's that's important, you know, mm -hmm. as authentically to, to just take that risk and kind of bring the music into the into most things uh presentations classes etc and uh it's been a, a pretty big uh success so far I, like i said it's it's always been joyful and if there have been negative reactions or neutral reactions i've just kind of used those as ways to discuss hmm you might not think this is the best idea for a facilitator to stand up here and talk about you know she's in a rush tribute band. <laughs> you, you can still use that as as a as a teaching block or as as a oh. as an incentive to to start the conversation um yeah. there's there's something you said earlier um that i hope i'm paraphrasing you right so if you're not inspired by your message yourself, then stay away from the mic, basically, or, or stay the hell off the stage. Because if you're not inspired by your own stuff, then how are you going to expect to inspire somebody else with it, right? Yeah. Am I paraphrasing you about right? Basically. I mean, yeah. I, I don't know that I would say stay the hell away from them. I mean, but kind of. I, I mean, usually with speakers, if I'm coaching speakers, I'll say if you're not feeling inspired, you may need to, you may not be ready yet to get right. to the mic and, and you need yeah. to, you know, reevaluate what is the conviction behind what you're saying. And mm -hmm. similarly, I mean, this is one of the reasons I absolutely love being in a Rush tribute band because every song I sing is Rush. And so I'm always going to love it. I'm always going to bring the full power of Rush, you know, uh, to myself and then to hopefully to others and to our fans. Here's something that one of my teachers taught me, my public speaking teachers, if there is such a thing, I think there's such a thing. And he, he reminded me of his mantra, and I'm not sure if he really does this every time, but I, I adopted it. He said, every time you step on a stage, and whether that is actually literally taking steps on the riser and walking on, on, a, on a raised stage, or whether it's just the front of a room, or on a, on a Zoom call, doesn't really matter. You're, you're stepping into a room or into a space where the eyes are on you for whatever reason. He said, the mantra that he tells himself and now I tell myself is, it's not about me. Mm. It's about the audience. Mm -hmm. So, and, and th this, this is where, and after I understood what he meant, I now have this, this, this self-importance gauge built in. So if, if I see other people present, I, I immediately recognize that they're all about themselves, if they are. Mm 
Absolutely. And you, you can you can quickly discern between those who do it for the audience because they think their message is relevant to the audience and those who are just up there because they like the limelight so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, living in the limelight, as Rush would say. Uh, there you go. <laughs> sorry, I can make anything into a Rush quote. You can test me. <laughs> I, I've even made memes for Vicky out, out of Rush. From you <laughs> have, Brett, and I really appreciated that. <laughs> oh, no, there's just well, we need to share them here in the comment box. Box, right we're, yeah. we're, we're, <laughs> now you're just wetting my appetite i would bring him up yeah, yeah. No, and great. i know and i almost feel like asking brett to sing some opera because you know i'm, I'm just so curious <laughs> now but i think christian your point is really interesting because i guess i would i would maybe add to that mm -hmm. that it is not about it is about the audience and it's about us and i and i think there's a connection there there's a bridge between you know, there's a thread that holds us together. And I think that's why music has been such a powerful force for me to bring clients into the fold. You know, I've often uh, had lunch with prospects, like prospective clients and talk to them about the band and then they come and they show up and they, they see me in this whole other context and it helps them remember me. So even if they don't hire me right then, maybe a year later, they're gonna be like, yeah, that's that lady in the Rush tribute band. There's a, there's a thread, I think a silver thread or some kind of, you know, uh, powerful thread that is connecting the speaker to the audience, the singer or the guitarist or the drummer to the audience where energy just kind of flows between you. And I think that's why it's so memorable and why uh, it adds, I think to, to your point, Christian, that, that energy where it was, you were describing in the, in the club in, in Germany that people were actually starting to move because they were sort of being fueled by that. Right. And in order to, uh, especially for people who may be resistant to some of the ideas that we might be sharing. So let's say we're doing a session on anti-racism or uh, doing a session on a culture that someone has had difficulty with, and maybe there's more resistance. Uh, I've also noticed that the music can kind of break down some of that uh, resistant energy before you even get started. Mm -hmm. and, and that it then allows things to flow between you and the audience and kind of have that exchange and that this is why it's so meaningful to me, you know. Good point. And uh, I'm, I'm gonna be in full disclosure here. I, I'm, I tend to get emotional around certain topics and I found that it's hard for me to control my emotionality. And it happened to me in the training room too, in, in corporate rooms, in really stiff, structured corporate <laughs> rooms. And, yeah. um, I recognize something that even even when it's not a, um, a high positive emotion that we're relaying to the audience, even if it, if it's more somber or maybe sad or thought provoking or whatever the emotion may be, it's still authentic. Mm -hmm. And if and I for the longest time I tried to suppress that and hide that mm -hmm. because I thought I'm being unprofessional. And it happened to me in, again, in a German corporate room, which those tend to be very um, unemotional. I'm not, I don't wanna make a blanket generalization, but most of the German corporate training rooms that I've been in were a little bit more by the book. And there I was um, getting teary eyed over the subject that we were discussing. Mm. And mm. I was antsy at first how this would come across and and, and the, the stakeholder in the company that contracted me was also in the room after the session came up to me and said i'm happy it went that way mm. yeah yeah it moved lovely. something yes it, it moved did. something whereas perhaps if you had listened to that voice that said i need to be professional you know and, and i think that's a great point around just the word professional like what does that even mean because mm. You know, cross culturally, it, of course, it means different things cross culturally, but it also means different things to us individually. And one of my favorite things about living in other cultures is the and, you know, that I now can be my American self and my, uh, and add these components of Indian culture, Nepali culture, you know, Mexican culture. And, and I think professionalism, there's an and opportunity there too, that when we, bring our professional selves, we can bring authenticity into that and make it a part of that professionalism. And as long as we're credible and we know what we're doing, <laughs> to at least to some extent, <laughs> um, and, and we, we can produce results, 
sometimes it does pay to almost like push the envelope a little bit of what professional means. And, and I, I think right. you did that. And the result was clear that, you know, there's that something moved in that training room, something was shifted and that the results were obviously positive that this client really was happy with the way things went. And sometimes the clients don't even know that they need that. Mm. You know, they, they don't even know that maybe they have some of that energy locked up or uh, that they need the perspective to shift. And sometimes the easiest way to shift perspective is just to shake things up a little bit. And so that's, for me, that's professional too, you know, pushing the envelope and <laughs> taking some risks. Yep. Because no risk, no fun. Brett, that's what's right. the biggest, what's the biggest risk you took in a training room? Well, I think uh, as I just using that video, I just mentioned before, but mm. that, that video is I've had, I've had people burst into tears mm. in watching that mother in that split second say, no, I don't think my daughter's beautiful. Mm. And they've gone, oh, they, they have that reaction. Oh, my God, how could she say that? Now, does this mother not think her daughter is beautiful? Absolutely, she thinks her daughter is beautiful. She knows she's beautiful. That's her daughter. It's her pride and joy. There is such a deep pride and, and, and really, you know, you, can, you, you know it's there, but... It's the context of the playing of the instrument. That is the message there. That's why I bring that message in. But, you know, some people go, my God, that's terrible. And they, and you can see them go to judgment, right? You can see it. Or some of them even say, oh, it's so typical Chinese. No, it's not. <laughs> it's like, because the, the reputation of tiger mums and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So you get people, you expose some stereotypes that people have. And that, and that, for me, that's a risk in then, managing that dynamic in that room without being accusatory towards them without saying see i told you so you're you're biased you know mm -hmm. <laughs> but, to, but to say okay so let's look at your reaction let's look at my reaction and and see what the differences are and how we can expose those in terms of what you're about to go into and many of these people are about to push their boat off the shore and go and live in these countries right mm. so that, so that that visceral reaction, you want to make them aware of it and see how it exists in them, and and, and that, that that can that can bring out some real <laughs> dangerous situation. It's never failed me yet. I mean, I, obviously, I pick my times when to do it. It's never failed me, but you can you can you know analyze uh, not analyze it. I'm not, I'm not a big fan of the word analyze. You can deconstruct it in a in a really positive and effective way. So yeah. And you know, what was coming up for me as you were sharing that about stereotypes is like, you know, in the music community, there's obviously as a woman, a female rock musician, uh, I think in some ways I've kind of gotten exposed to my own stereotypes about myself. Like I had a, a blind spots. So I never really thought about, you know, myself as a female musician and, and some of that, ex just the exposure to some of the things I've experienced, which almost have been completely positive. I haven't had a lot of, you know, challenges in this area, but I've had some. And it's almost like this is my own blind spot, you know, around uh, just biases in the music community. I just never thought about it. And I just never mm. gave it a second thought. And, and now I'm able to, you know, it kind of exposed me to, to the stereotype and it allows me to maybe engage a little bit more with that. So I think Brett, your point is really important that, you know, music and risk taking are things that can expose our own blind spots as facilitators, can expose the blind spots of those that we that we teach, that we coach. Mm. And there's just endless opportunity for that. And, you know, and, and it, musically, I, I'm, I don't know, I'm kind of just waking up to some of that myself as a female musician. Mm. There aren't that many front rock women are there I, I can't think of a whole lot there are um there are other female um lead singers of rush tribute bands around the u.s um and around the world but it is kind of yeah it's it's sort of unique it's definitely mm. i'm the only one in atlanta that i know of. <laughs> there's there's two <laughs> two rush tribute bands in atlanta and uh and yeah there's plenty and of the other uh, one sucks. Oh gosh, no, they're good. <laughs> they're friends of ours. They're friends of ours. Um, <laughs> our fans are very loyal, but no. Um, yeah, there, there's uh, some wonderful female singers, uh, front people in Atlanta bands that um, 
some of whom I hope are watching and uh, they're yes. amazing. But yeah, it's just an interesting area to to explore for me. You know, it was something I wasn't even really thinking about all that much. And now I'm a little bit more aware of it so I can speak with other women and support them. Here's one. Here's a reminder. Yvonne reminds us of the pretenders, right? Chrissy Hind. Oh, absolutely. Scotland, Scotland right, Chrissy? Um, I have a question for you, musically inclined trainers, facilitators. What would you advise people who are in the adult learning space for uh, what's the biggest umbrella term we can come up with uh, people who are not in tune as much with their musical side or who may not be as comfortable or who just don't do what you do and they don't have that experience or that skill set how can they bring music into the room how can they use music to expand the experience for their students and learners some some tips from you guys. I had an example of this um, recently. So I'm a certified disc practitioner, and uh, my husband is like the almost the opposite disc profile of me, which apparently is really common. We tend to marry our disc opposites because it helps complement and you know expand us, right? It adds to us. And uh, I remember once listening to a song, and I really wish I could remember what the song was because it would make it probably more amusing. But we were listening to the same song. And we had such incredibly different interpretations of the song. I mean, his was much more sort of cynical and, you know, um, pessimistic. And mine was like fairy tale land, you know. And we looked at each other because he's taken the disc assessment. When I was getting certified, I used him as a test subject. And he said, and I, we looked at each other and it was like, oh, I think we're having a disc moment. And it was so much fun to deconstruct that. So I think that even just the way that songs people could bring their favorite song into the training room and look at how different cultures would interpret the song, um, what kind of lens would they use. It could be an icebreaker exercise where you have everybody stand up and just move around because, you know, in a, in a training room or in coaching, now that I'm doing a lot, of, lot, a lot of virtual training, I often use music right in the middle of my virtual trainings. I just start a song going and I get everybody to stand up and move around and I say, turn your camera off so you can boogie down and, you know, nobody's going to see you, but it'll help you to, to be refreshed for the next segment that we're going to talk about. Yep. Stay brave. So there's yep. so many, so many wonderful ways. But, Brett, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Too. Well, I'm pretty lazy. So when it comes to uh, using videos, I use the, not to keep harping on Ben Zander, but I use the Ben Zander video, the TED Talk that he did in Vail a couple of years ago, 2012 or something. And uh, where he takes people, he takes the audience through the journey of understanding, of, of hearing a piece of music, in this case, Chopin's uh, Ninth Symphony, uh, part of that, and this movement that he starts, and he explains the progression of the chords, and, the, and he does this in a way that kind of invites people to say, and he absolutely says at the start, I guarantee by the end of this, everybody will love classical music by the end of this. Right now, it's about 3%, and I know that you know, those 3% are tuned in, they're ready for it. You know, the, the other group are kind of not bad. They use classical music as background smoke and, you know, it's a little bit of a volley at the end of the day, doesn't hurt anybody. And then there's the group that just don't think they can, they, they can uh, love classical music at all. But what he did bring, I think the point is that he brings in the, the point of saying people often say they're tone deaf. And he said, and he actually makes a point. I'd never really realised this. I thought, I've heard other people sing and think, yeah, that, that's tone deaf. I couldn't carry a, a note of it had a handle on it. But the but he does say you you can't be tone deaf. Everybody is in tune. Like otherwise, you couldn't change the gears on your manual car, on your stick shift mm -hmm. car. You couldn't. He, he uses the joke. You couldn't answer the phone and li listen to your mother. You know, mother speak. Because you can hear your mother speak, and not only can you hear her speak, but you can know what mood she's in, right? Mm. So technically, we're not tone deaf. So he brings that. He gets the audience, right? okay, well, now this is something I should listen to. And then he, at the end of it, he basically brings it full circle. And he, and he really it gets, and it's a, I, I play this video for a lot of people. I, I linked it in the comments. And he says, I want you to bring a person into your mind that you – a dear loved one, a partner, a parent, or a grandparent that is no longer with you anymore, right? Bring that person into your mind, sit there and listen to this piece of music from start to finish, 
the because this piece of music is about going away and coming home. Mm. Listen to this piece of music, and he says that you will hear everything that Chopin had to say. And then he plays this piece of music, and you can hear a pin drop in this place. Mm. It is, and I played this video for people while I've been traveling in the car with them, in, and it's very rare for them not to have a pretty, you know, pretty wet eyes by the end of it, right? When you when you have that experience and you'll get you're built up to prepare yourself for this experience. So that's where I, I use this video. I mean, it's a I, I, I wish there was a shorter version of it because he tells a lot of story, great stories, a great storyteller. Um, but I think that um, I think that there was there was a music that was music. <laughs> my phone. Um, but I think possibly uh, that's the best way I I like to use the expertise of other people that actually really have the chops and uh, and get them to expose people to music and the possibility of, of yes, the different, you hear it one way, they hear it another, uh, but it's the same piece of music. You're just bringing your own experience into it and you, like you do in a training room, we all bring our own experience. We all prepare ourselves with our own experiences, our own perceptions, our own biases. And we come across people in our lives through the lens of those biases. Um, that's kind of, you know, maybe, I mean, it, it looks different. It seems to go smoother when I'm in a training room. It's hard to explain it, though, sometimes, isn't it? <laughs> I think there was a, a, a very interesting point in what you just said, Brett, in the, about the tone deafness. Reminding people, whether they're your students or your clients or whatever your relationship to them is, reminding them that they already have the skill in them to do something. That's right. Yeah, that's right. That, that's brilliant. That, yeah. That, that yeah. they might be afraid to access that skill or that tool that's, that's buried somewhere inside of them because somebody told them, like the mother in, in the video that you mentioned, that the daughter is not beautiful, or that somebody told you you're tone deaf, or somebody said you can't hold a tune, Absolutely. or that, that you, you, whatever, whatever the self imposed limitation you tell yourself, or others told you, and now you believe it and you keep telling it yourself. So if you, if our job, is to inspire greatness and other ins inspire expansion as vicky said earlier then it is to remind people that you already have the tool in you right and let's bring it out and don't be afraid of using it because you'll recognize as you use it it's beautiful and it'll mm. get you the result that you want and that is true yeah. for so many things in life and for us for for our clients is you know how to connect with other people that are not like you. It may be uncomfortable at first. You're not used to a few behavioral twitches here and there, but you inherently, you know how to do it because you made friends in the sandbox when you were a toddler mm. and somebody tried to take away your plastic excavator. You still made friend with that person and it worked out. You know how to do this. Life has taught you to suppress how to do that. And our job is to help you rediscover that, right? That is so profound, Christian. I mean, really, that is, and Brett, both. I mean, that is a, yeah, I'm, I'm really processing that one because I think sometimes as facilitators and coaches, we might get in that trap of feeling like we're imparting or sharing information that, you know, developing skills, helping leaders develop skills that, they need mm. to build. But really what I'm hearing from the two of you, and, and I love this idea, is almost just open the gate, you know, open the gate to something you already have. Absolutely. You know how to do this. And music is the absolute best example of this because it is probably the most, besides food, it's like the most universal uniting force. You know, you, you and, it, and eating, it's also a way to while celebrate. To music. Yes. It's even better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, really. you, and, know, uh, you know what Ben Zander does at the start? He he teaches at university and he and I've seen him I've seen him on video tell a group of university professors this. He said, I tell you what, what I do when I walk into the room with my students at the very first class at the beginning of the year, I walk in and I say, You've all passed. <laughs> You've all passed. Yeah. Pressure's off. Don't worry about it. Mm. And he said, they, it's, it's kind of like that, well, ah, this guy's joking. He said, no, I guarantee everybody, everybody in this class has already passed. You've already got the passing grade. But yeah. there's the catch. I want you to sit there and I want you to write me a letter of how you 
are going to bring your, live yourself into the promise of that past grade I've already given you. And it'll be different from, for everybody. And he, but he said, I want you to write it on a piece of paper and I want you to give it to me and I want, to, I want you to tell me how you're going to live into that possibility. Mm. That's, a, you know, that's a whole different way of, re, of framing teaching. It's a, it's a way of saying, the, like I've got a bricklayer friend. He's a down and dirty working class dude. And he says, you know, when I build a brick wall, I don't start with the brick on the bottom left-hand side. I think about the brick on the far top right-hand side. And I think about where I want that. I want that. The want that to finish up, and that's where the wall comes to perfection. When I know that I can visualize where that brick's going to be at the end of the day, when I lay that last brick. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can honestly say that, in spirit of Rush, I've kind of seen that in myself. That you know, I've all I knew. I loved Rush. I knew I had it in me to be a stage performer because I'm a public speaker for a living. Although it is a different, it's a very different experience right. playing Absolutely. music on stage. So you're juggling a lot more. Yeah. Um, but I knew that I had it in me. And over these seven years, it really has just been a process of opening the gate and just letting that out. It was not so much. I mean, I did need to build some of the skills in a way, but I also just needed to let let go and, and let my authentic self out. And yeah. I love the idea of encouraging our clients to do that. But I think the best almost one of the best ways we could do that is by modeling it ourselves. As Christian said earlier, you know, we if we model that authenticity and just saying it is inherent in human nature to connect and let me show you what I mean and, and have this music and food and these things that do connect and unite us, yeah. it'll model that behavior, model the respect, um, you know, model the connection. And, and maybe that's why people have responded so positively to the music in the, in the classroom or in my, in my audiences of 500 or whatever keynote speaking, whatever <laughs> it is, you know, they all seem to love it possibly because it's just modeling the very thing that we seem to need the most right now, mm. which is this, you know, connectivity and, and just, yeah, building a bridge between us. Absolutely. Mic, mic drop. That was it. <laughs> no, I mean, we, we, we are what we're at the, we're at the hour. Look at that. Wow. That, that is like and it flew seems by. Like, it, it seems like it's five minutes. Thank you, Vicky, so much again. This is fantastic. You, 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 we've taken more time than we probably promised, but this is good. I could talk about this all day. We should do it I again. I know. Like we could have think. part two at some point. Uh, Absolutely. And I, I would encourage anybody who's watching this replay um, to comment, send us, uh, to reach out to Vicky. Where, where can we find you, Vicky? Where, where, where can we find Vicky Hudson um, on social yeah. media or other? Yeah, so uh, definitely LinkedIn, Facebook. My website is highroaders.com. Yeah. The Spirit of Rush is on Facebook. And uh, just you can put the search in the Spirit of Rush Atlanta because there was a uh, Spirit of Rush in Denver. They don't exist anymore, but they still appear on Facebook. So if you put in Spirit of Rush Atlanta, you'll find us and join our page and see our videos and connect with me any which way. Fantastic. Thank you so much again. Thank you to my always esteemed colleague, Christian, wonderful. <laughs> and, uh, rock and roll! Rock and roll! <laughs> rock and roll. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for having me on. This was uh, a blast. Alrighty. So th thank Thanks, you. Vicky. Again. We'll see you. Um, send us your comments. Send, send us your, your suggestions, questions, any questions for Vicky. If you want to send them to us, we'll pass them on and we'll, uh, we'll get back. But again, thank you again, Vicky. And uh, we are out. And uh, have a wonderful afternoon, everybody. Rock on, everybody. <laughs>